Our next speaker of the day served in key leadership positions from Lieutenant to Major General in light mechanized formations over the last 28 years in the Australian Army. He has operational combat tours in South Korea, Kuwait, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the privilege to introduce Commander, Australian Defense College, Major General Mick Ryan. Well, good afternoon, my name is Major General Mick Ryan. I'm from the Australian Army and I'm uh, pre-recording this from Canberra, uh, but I'll be available for Q&A at the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you to Pat Donoghue for inviting me to talk today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to a bunch of Army professionals, uh, the US Army senior leaders, uh, about what is a really important topic uh, for me and, and for everyone that's participating in this virtual warfighter conference, and that's leadership uh, of our people in the 21st century. Um, to be able to get together and have these kind of professional discussions are really important for the current generational leaders and, most importantly, the next generational leaders who are going to face some pretty profound challenges over the next several decades. And we need to make sure that as soldiers and leaders, we're preparing them well. I think the challenge that we're all facing has been very well described in a series of documents over the last few years. Uh, for me, one of, the, one of the best and most important uh, for you as well is your national defence strategy. And, and it really uh, gets at the, the nub of the problem for military professionals and indeed everyone in the national security community about this new age of competition, uh, about how two large powers are now competing for influence uh, around the globe and how technology in, in moving so very quickly is having a profound influence, not just on that strategic competition, but our societies uh, every single day we're seeing this influence. But I have to say, uh, we're pretty lucky because we've actually seen this before. We've seen a lot of it before. Uh, we've seen this at least three times over the last 250 years uh, during the first, second and third industrial revolutions. The first industrial revolution obviously commenced in the late 1700s in the United Kingdom uh, and then spread to places like the United States, Germany and France in the 1820s and 1830s. It was driven by steam. Uh, and the steam engine, uh, which ended up driving railroads and steam boats uh, and telegraph, really had a profound influence, not just on societies, but on how war was waged. Uh, and perhaps the most uh, important manifestation of that was the US Civil War, where we saw railroads, steam boats, uh, the telegraph, allow the Union to embrace a continental strategy but it wasn't the last industrial revolution. Uh, we saw another one at the end of the 1800s, which continued right to the start of the First World War. This time it was driven by the internal combustion engine, by electricity, uh, by the development of radio and chemicals, and uh, towards the start, or certainly of the 20th century, of the flight. And this manifested certainly in the First World War and all the way through till the end of the Second World War. And then we saw the Third Industrial Revolution, which was more a digital revolution. It was about the development of computers, network, and then eventually the internet, but also the birth of space travel. And we saw this manifest in military institutions throughout the Cold War. Uh, and I guess its ultimate manifestation was the Gulf War in 1991, where things like stealth and precision weapons really demonstrated to the world how war was transforming uh, during this third industrial revolution. But what we're seeing now is a different kind of revolution. Uh, the World Economic Forum is calling this a fourth industrial revolution, but it's a different kind of revolution. The first three revolutions that I just talked about really occurred in the physical world. This time, the evolution is in the cognitive realm. And that's why I called my presentation Leadership in the Cognitive Age. 
But what's more important is that these changes in the cognitive realm, particularly with technologies like artificial intelligence, but new age influence tools with social media, uh, underpins something that's profoundly different from the previous industrial revolutions, and that's speed. The pace of change in this industrial revolution is unprecedented. Um, there's a quote that I've put here from Max Boot in his book, War Made New, where he examines just how long previous industrial revolutions took and just how quickly this one is occurring. Uh, the most recent uh, US National Intelligence Council assessment uh, covered off in this in, in some detail, where it talked about just how the pace of change driven by things like artificial intelligence, uh, autonomous systems, uh, algorithms, big data, high performance computing really is having a significant impact on not just the pace of change in technology, but in the pace of change in geopolitics, the pace of change in societies. And it's driving an explosion in the growth of human knowledge. There's a great curve uh, that's called the Buckminster full of knowledge doubling curve, where he talks about just how quickly knowledge has taken to double in humankind over the last century or so. Uh, at this point in 2020, human knowledge is doubling every year or two. And that is something that's very, very different to what we've seen before. And what it's doing is driving an explosive growth in new technologies and the evolution of old technologies. It's really accelerating technological change. This was examining another great uh, document that's worth reading if you haven't already, the National Security Strategy. And it's acknowledged in that document where the uh, technological advantage that the United States and other Western nations have had enjoyed for many decades is slowly starting to level out. We won't always have a technological advantage over adversaries. And in many areas, uh, long range strike and long range fires, just being two examples, uh, the Chinese and the Russians are very, very advanced. But this accelerating pace of change is not just occurring uh, in these systems I've just talked about, we're seeing an explosive growth in patents, particularly in the US, but also in other countries like China. Another area where we're seeing explosive growth is in autonomous systems. This slide here just talks to the growth of robotics, industrial robotics in China, but that is replicated in many, many other areas uh, in technology and in particular in China. We're also seeing a huge decrease in the cost of biotechnologies. Uh, there's a curve known as Carlson's curve, which uh, goes to the significant um, cuts in costs for how much it costs to decode a genome. Uh, the very first uh, human genome cost about $300 million to decode. Currently at the moment, it probably costs you about $1,000. This is uh, lowering the bar to access to a whole range of different players in biotechnologies, which can lead to both exciting but also very scary um, possibilities in the future. Also seeing an explosive and accelerating growth in space-based capability, particularly in uh, smaller satellites and less expensive satellites. Some have called this space 2.0. I'll, I'll leave those kind of titles to the experts but it's another example of this accelerating pace of change we're seeing in the environment. But it's important to understand that it's not just in technology that we're seeing these explosive growth rates. We're seeing it in our society, in areas like urbanisation. Uh, just a few years ago, for the first time in human history, more humans than ever lived in urban areas. And we're seeing that continue to grow as I've shown on this slide here. Now, all that's manifesting in humans uh, becoming less and less able to absorb change. You know, when we saw in the second industrial revolution, the, the introduction of radio, that happened over a couple of decades. It happened at a pace that people were able to appreciate the change, to absorb it, absorb it into how they thought and how they did business. Uh, that is not what we're seeing at the moment. 
And this fella called uh, Astro Teller, who works for Google X, uh, has one of the best job titles that I can possibly imagine, came up with this curve, which was published in uh, uh, Tom Friedman's book, Thank You for Being Late. And it, what the curve shows is that the pace of change versus humans' capacity to absorb change uh, has evolved over time. And his view, and I, I think there's some evidence for it, is humans' capacity to absorb change to deal with the rapid pace of change in the environment is being overwhelmed. And for many people, indeed, this is quite a bewildering environment. And of course, as we've seen this year, probably a year, most people would prefer to forget uh, many changes that have already been apparent before this year have been accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, whether it's change in the geopolitical environment, whether it's change in economics, change in national supply change and national resilience. Uh, COVID-19 over the last six to eight months seems to have accelerated change in a lot of those areas. But I have to be very frank with you, I don't see this as a pessimistic environment. In fact, everyone is having to deal with this pace of change. Our adversaries, our competitors and our potential enemies down the track all have to deal with this pace of change and therein lies a lot of opportunities. So how do we exploit this opportunity? Well, I guess as commander of a defence college, which has a war college, command and staff college, um, and a range of other training and educational institutions, you'd expect me to say this. But I honestly believe we need to turn to our people and their ideas for an intellectual edge to get through the 21st century. It's not the only advantage we need to generate. Obviously, mass technology, geography, all convey and have historically conveyed um, uh, advantage over potential and real adversaries. But this intellectual edge is something different. Not only does it allow us to outthink our adversaries, but it allows us to bind all other elements of military and national power in this grand strategic competition that we're all going to be part of over the coming decades. Now, this intellectual edge, and I've written about it in, in other forum and, and spoken about it before, is a composite edge. It's composed of an individual uh, element and it's also composed of an institutional component. For an individual, uh, this is really the capacity to be able to creatively outthink uh, and outcompete an adversary uh, and to do that uh, through their education, their training, their experience, their guile, their cunning, and their ability to form relationships with other people that are effective, collaborative, and build a bigger picture. The second piece is the institutional intellectual edge. Um, and there's probably no better example of that than what you're doing here today. Uh, with senior leadership that uh, Pat Donahue's pulled together here, you in the discussions, listening to each other, uh, putting out ideas are building this institutional intellectual edge. But it's actually composed of a whole range of different elements uh, of teams of people at different scales and units, training in strategic headquarters and the broader national security community. So what do organisations need to do to build this institutional intellectual edge? Well, I think there's several things that institutions can do and indeed the US Army and other military institutions are already doing to a degree. The first thing is you need to have a plan. You need to have a vision of what we want out of our people as individuals and as teams at all the different scales that we train and educate our people from squad all the way up to army level. And I think, you know, for you and the US Army, you have a wonderful start point. Uh, the multi-domain manoeuvre document that was published in 2018 has, I think, very clear intent here about maximising human potential. That's the start point for a plan. Um, and I think that, you know, if we build on that as a vision for developing this intellectual edge, uh, it's a great place to start. But there's other things that institutions need to do. Uh, we need to ensure that we're building a more continuous learning approach. Our historic approach to learning 
has been not just residential largely, but it's also been episodic. Uh, but if you have a look at the histories of World War II and the leaders that were most successful, they were the ones who engaged in continuous learning in the interwar period. Continuous learning is where it's at. It's where we need to transition our institutions to. It's tough, uh, but it's possible and it's a mindset. The third element uh, for development of an institutional intellectual edge is improving access to learning. Every single one of our soldiers, NCOs, warrant officers and officers must have constant access to learning resources. Now, that's pretty hard, especially when you have a training regime that's going through a whole range of different levels of training in combined arms and in joint task forces. Uh, but we need to give people access to all kinds of learning wherever they are, whenever they are. Um, that broader accessibility has to be a really important uh, objective for every 21st century military institution. A fourth area where we develop the institutional intellectual edge is in strategic engagement. What we're doing now, right, by having me talk and having General Air talk earlier today uh, at this forum. But it's about our liaison officers that we exchange between units and, and training institutions. It's about the broader interaction that we have as military institutions to share ideas, share processes, share concepts, share TTPs and weapon systems and how we employ them. But it's not just a military to military thing. It's not just operating units and, and academic institutions. It's about military institutions working with academia and industry as well they all have something to add. If you look at civilian universities, they have hundreds of years of knowledge inherent in them. There's stuff we can learn from them. There's stuff we can uh, share. Uh, if nothing else, we can use them to red team some of our ideas. So that strategic engagement is a really important part of sharing ideas, testing each other's ideas and building uh, a more robust, resilient and adaptive uh, intellectual edge for institutions. Another way I think institutions need to get at this intellectual edge is investing in uh, artificial intelligence to support decision making. It doesn't replace decision making. In fact, there's no AI at the moment that can make, you make decisions across the breadth of things that we need to make decisions on. It's just not possible. Whilst we see lots of uh, hoo-ha about uh, computers playing Go or chess, if you take that same algorithm, uh, that made those amazing moves in Go and told it to draw a cat, uh, you would see the blue, green of death. Whereas a human, and the human brain is far more agile. Uh, and the other thing that AI suffers from, it doesn't, it doesn't understand context, whereas humans do. So AI for us, at least in the next couple of decades, is really going to be about decision support. Now, one of the ways we might think about this is the theory of the extended mind, uh, which was developed in the late 90s, has now been further evolved uh, through scholars at the Leverholm Institute and other places with this concept of AI extenders, where we use algorithms to extend some human cognitive functions, and I've listed some uh, on the slide here, to ensure that we're able to make better, higher quality decisions more rapidly. And this can take place at the tactical level, uh, at the operational level, in, at the strategic level. Um, there's no real endeavour where humans need to think and decide that might not be enhanced with artificial intelligence and algorithms using these AI extenders. It doesn't replace human decision making, but it does help us to make better decisions. And finally, as we build this institutional intellectual edge, we need checkpoints to ensure what we're doing is being done in accordance with the plan we've established, but also being achieved in line with our institutional values. Um, an ethical approach to developing this capability, particularly in the use of autonomous weapons, is not just important to us as a military institution, but it's important to the societies uh, that we all serve proudly. So that's how we might think about constructing an intellectual edge at the institutional level. I'd like to finish the presentation with some ideas about how we might build this intellectual edge 
uh, as individuals. Essentially, what do you need to do to construct this intellectual edge? I think the very first and most important thing as individuals is that we all need to understand that we are part of a profession and that comes with certain standards of behaviour and these. Now, for everyone in this audience, I'm sure that uh, is just something that you understand deeply uh, and as an inherent part of your responsibilities as a US Army officer. But that hasn't always been the case for many people in our profession in different services. And indeed, many of our people still don't appreciate the imperatives of belonging to a profession and what it means for being a steward of the profession, for developing professional excellence and uh, living according to the values of our institution and those of our nation. The second part for us to uh, develop this individual intellectual edge is to be intellectually humble and insatiably curious. This is what underpins continuous learning and indeed lifelong learning for, for us. And as us, we need to be exemplars of this to the people that we lead, uh, the people we serve alongside. So, you know, that humility is such an important part of learning. We never stop learning. Um, there is no rank at which you can't learn something from private soldier all the way through to general. There's always something we can learn. Part of this is developing good reading habits. Um, every Wednesday, I, I have lunch with training officers at our, our officer academy here in Canberra. And the last question I ask them is, what are they reading? And I'm trying to spark in them a, a desire and a love of reading because that's what underpins a lot of their professional learning. It's what underpinned a lot of the professional learning of, of all of us who are part of this Warfighter Conference. And finally, part of this intellectual humility and insatiable curiosity is developing the capacity to write well. Uh, writing well is not about writing books. It's developing the capacity to research it's developing the capacity to think critically and it's developing the capacity to communicate clearly, which is leaders is so very important when one of the things we must do is communicate purpose and inspire our people. A third area I think is very important to nurture this intellectual edge at the individual level is to embrace variety. Uh, to understand that lots of different people bring different ideas. I don't know in our profession that we've always been good at this. Um, ducks like ducks has uh, a certain ring of truth in it in many institutions. Uh, we need to embrace a broader array of people from different backgrounds and with different ideas to ensure that we're able to develop the the wide array of options that are required to address quite complex circumstances in the 21st century. A fourth area of developing intellectual edge is anticipating surprise. Uh, one thing I think democracies have perfected is getting the next war wrong. Um, we're always surprised uh, by the type of war. Uh, we're surprised in war. Uh, we see this constantly through military history, even in contemporary operations. We need to accept that it's just going to happen. No matter how much we try to prevent surprise, we are going to get surprised. So we need to train to educate our people, not just to accept it, but to fight through the shock that's always generated when you're surprised. And that's important from the tactical level all the way up to the strategic level. The fifth area is we need to have a training system and a training ethos that sees us skilling, reskilling and repeating for our entire lives. When the horse and cart drivers converted to truck drivers at the early 20th century, they could drive a truck for the rest of their career. These days, that's just not the case. When you're changing skill sets, those skills that you're developing now will probably be irrelevant in five years. We need to uh, reskill more quickly than we've ever had to before. Are our systems set up well for this and are our people well prepared and are we nurturing a culture that encourages that constant skilling, reskilling and repeating? 
The sixth area I think of developing our individual intellectual edge is building our technological literacy. Being able to competently operate a highly advanced bit of equipment is not technological literacy. Technological literacy is about understanding the broad array of new, disruptive and evolving technologies that we're seeing at the moment. It's not about being an engineer in all of them. It's not about having a PhD or a master's, but understanding enough about things like artificial intelligence, biotechnologies, hypersonics, additive manufacturing, quantum technologies, high-performance computing, understanding enough about these kind of things to be able to ask the right questions of experts and ensure that these kind of technologies are being inserted into our war fighting concepts, into our military strategies. The final area, and I'll finish with this when it comes to the inter intellectual edge at the individual level, is that we must constantly hone our capacity to provide clear purpose to our people. Anyone can give out a task, but purpose is the most important part of any mission statement. It's the most important part of any conversation with people when we're anticipating or going into very difficult circumstances. Um, We've seen throughout history where those who are able to inspire people to provide clear purpose are more likely to be successful. And it goes without saying that there's no machine, no artificial intelligence or no robot ever built or likely to be built that will be able to do this and to inspire our people. Can I just finish with this slide here? It's a picture of a surrender ceremony on a hill where the French were surrendering to the Prussians during the Franco-Prussian War. And there's a wonderful book on the Franco-Prussian War written by the late Michael Howard, where he talks about the reasons why the French lost. And I've included a short quote on this slide here. And it boils down to what essentially happened is the Prussians kept up with what was going on in the world and the French didn't. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty keen in the 21st century that we all are able to mirror what the Prussians did and not what the French did. So what I've described here today, what I've, what I've covered and what I think we need to do in this intellectual edge in both its individual and institutional manifestation, these are big asks. I've no doubt about that. But we've all done big, hard things before. Our nations have done big, difficult things in our history before, and we're more than capable of solving these challenges and addressing them in the 21st century. So my view is, let's just crack on with a job and get on with solving these problems. Thank you very much for your attention today. It's been a great honour and a privilege to be able to speak to you and to be able to listen to some of the wonderful presentations in this program that Pat and his team have put together. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm standing by in real time for Q&A. Thank you. Sir, this is Colonel Chris Budahas, the Chief of Staff at Fort Benning. How do you read this station? I'm good to go. It's good to talk to you this morning. Sir, I'll facilitate the question and answers. Do you have any opening comments before we go to those? No, I, uh, I think I've just made enough opening comments and I'm very happy to go straight to uh, Q&A. Uh, actually, I do have one comment. Um, just to my biography, I, I haven't served in Korea and I've only passed through Kuwait. Uh, my service has been in Iraq, Afghanistan and East Timor. Other than that, you've got it right on. Sir, thank you very much. Sir, our first question from the field is the following. Based on the increased technological advances in civil society and in the military, which you presented and during the video, how has the Australian Army modified its officer and NCO professional military education courses in content and length to meet the needs for a 21st century uh, military readiness stance? Um, it, it, it encompasses a range of different uh, initiatives. Uh, after Brigade Command, I went into command our training and doctrine, and we looked at, uh, I did a fairly systemic review of how we looked at training, education, uh, lessons learned and doctrine, because they're all joined up I guess, as, as one system. And what we found is that uh, we had a very good training culture. 
Um, you know, it was, it was as good as any, probably anywhere. Uh, but um, our culture for education, uh, which nurtures that that innovation, which nurtures that those higher level thinking skills, probably wasn't uh, the same. And we also found that it wasn't systemic, uh, that a lot of these things weren't joined up. We, we didn't have a lesson system that was joined up to constant improvement in training and education. So having a, a, a more systems view, which I think the US Army has uh, in spades, uh, is an important part. And then just investing in the key areas where you think you can generate advantage. Uh, for us, you know, it's, it's in certain areas. Uh, for the US Army, it'll be in a lot more in, in different areas. Uh, but this is, whilst technology is driving change, most of the improvements we need to make in preparing our people are supported by technology, but they aren't technological solutions. All the solutions about us coming up with good ideas, about leaders being advocates and exemplars, and leaders providing the time for um, the balancing of individual and collective development. And it's really hard, right? Um, time is the one thing in a unit, uh, in a battalion, in a, in, a, in a company, in a platoon, in a brigade, in a division. It's the one thing we always seem to lack, but good leaders are able to find time to invest in their people uh, to be part of a, a larger systemic training approach. Sir, thank you very much. Sir, from the field, we're getting a number of questions about interoperability. Um, does the speed of change versus the human ability to adapt to change make interoperability with allies and partners more or less difficult? What are the main challenges to interoperability generated by the fourth industrial revolution, the cognitive revolution that is? Um, well, firstly, I'd say that interoperability is, is a, a core skill. It's an institutional medal, I, I would suggest. suggest. Um, uh, there's no uh, Western military institution, uh, with the exception of perhaps the United States, that's able to uh, undertake the, the full range of military operations. Uh, but we're all better together um, and we're better together, not just because that brings a critical mass, but it also brings a sharing of ideas um, that I think uh, is, you know, the one plus one equals three kind of equation. Uh, is it more difficult with the speed of change? In certain uh, aspects, it certainly is. But I think also one of the benefits of alliances and partnerships is we can share the load of uh, keeping across change um, we can come up with different approaches to address the challenges that emerge from this pace of change. Uh, but more importantly, technology is enabling us to connect better than we ever have before. Uh, the profusion of blogs uh, and connectivity through social media um, has built a global discourse uh, amongst military professionals. I mean, there's people at the conference there that I've never met in person, but I've had uh, great interactions with, written articles with, um, you know, Pat Donahue's uh, one of those, but people like, you know, Doctrine Man and others in the US system uh, have been collaborators and uh, we've probably met each other once in person, but collaborated for many, many years through blogs and, and other mechanisms. So yes, the pace of change is difficult on relationships, uh, but if we value them and if we use technology cleverly, uh, we can share the load and we can come up with some pretty good solutions together, not apart. Sir, thank you. Uh, a couple of questions here um, on resistance to change. The question is, sir, an apparent resistance to change seems to be consistent across uh, militaries and errors. What factors do you believe contribute to this organizational behavior? Um, well, there's a few there. In fact, I'm giving a uh, giving another presentation to our uh, Special Operations Command that, that covers this exact topic. Um, there's a few different areas that uh, are reasons why uh, people can resist change. Um, the first one is uh, what uh, Wick Murray has called the tyranny of past success. You know, if you've gone through a decade or two without um, uh, being beaten or you've gone through the last couple of decades of being successful in the operating environment, what's the imperative to change? Um, you need to be able to recognise that. Um, the second one is 
that you know we're in inherently a a conservative culture now there's lots of very good reasons for that don't get me wrong um all good leaders want to be successful but all good leaders also want to keep their soldiers alive um so we're inherently uh conservative to in the balance of those two uh, really important imperatives but culture uh whether it's around branch uh, specializations around different rituals uh, and tradition sometimes can get in the way of change. Um, tradition's important, uh, but only to the degree that it helps us be successful as individuals and as teams. And the third piece is uh, you need to provide, I guess, proof that change is needed and that the kinds of changes that we want to make are more likely to make us successful than what we're doing at the moment. So you, you put those all together, and that's a big ask for uh, institutional leaders um, who seek to continue evolving professional military institutions so they can be successful in the 21st century. Now, there's some great examples of this. You know, um, I think the interwar period uh, example in the US in particular has some great examples of institutional transformation. Um, the post-Vietnam era, certainly saw the same in the US Army. So we can look to those kind of examples. They're not templates for us, but they do give us lessons in how we might more successfully tra transform our institutions and do that in a more cons constant rather than episodic way uh, to deal with uh, the environment that we're all facing at the moment and will in the coming decades. Thank you, sir. A couple of questions uh, reference, you know, so you're very active on social media and uh, obviously publishing too. Uh, what's your advice to senior military leaders to effectively leverage uh, technology for leader development and messaging? Um, it's a double-edged sword, of course. Um, you need to uh, be a wise user of technology. Um, you know, there are certain parts of social media where we see um, some pretty awful and uh, frankly repulsive behavior. Uh, but there are some really positive parts of it. It has enabled uh, a level of connectivity between members of our profession that we have never, ever seen before. Um, the, you know, this was led in the United States, to be frank, over the last decade with blogs and, and social media. It's, it's now proliferated to the rest of us in Western military institutions. Uh, but it's allowed uh, a new generation of young officers, particularly um, uh, lieutenant colonels and below and NCOs as well, to connect with each other within their institutions, but with similar like-minded institutions overseas. Um, there's a site here called Grand Curiosity that has a map across the world of all the different uh, communities that you might be able to link in and, and discuss professional issues, obviously in an unclassified environment but there's lots you can, you can do in that environment. Um, Pat and I have just co-authored um, an article with uh, Major General Smith uh, about why we think general officers should use social media. And that might be a guide for some of the people listening. Um, it, is a, it is a wonderful way to show off the achievements of our people. I mean, one of the great things about being in an army, and I've been in this army for 33 years and, and, and love it, um, is that our people do amazing things every day that are just never seen outside the immediate unit. We should show that off uh, because these are great young service people um, and they're worthy of showing off every single day. Uh, but it's a great way to share um, ideas. It's a great way for our families to be better engaged with the institution. Um, so what used cleverly, um, used with a view to operational security and your personal security, you know, we can leverage technology to to foster uh, individual and team learning in a way that we just have never been able to before. Thanks, sir. Our next question from the field is the following. How does the Australian Army develop its leaders to compete with China and Russia in the Indo-Pacific regions, low level of conflict? Well, I think the most important thing we do uh, is just, firstly, you've got to teach leaders that know how to win. Um, and then you can, and 
look at different uh, potential adversaries and competitors after that. But, you know, a, a tough, professional, demanding leader development continuum. And it's not a one-off. You, you don't start at your officer training and then it finishes there. Um, so it needs to be tough, professional, demanding and broad but it needs to be continuous. And, and in our army, um, we have uh, all core officer training continuum and all core soldier training continuum uh, that starts from your first day and you progress through different courses at different ranks. And leadership is at the heart of that continuum because um, we learn more about leadership every day, even though I think the military really are the true uh, exemplars of, of developing leaders in our societies. Um, but we learn more about leadership every day. You've got to keep learning. And our people change. You know, kind of young soldiers we get and the leadership uh, requirements they have evolves over time as well. So I guess at heart you need, it's got to be tough. It's got to be demanding. It needs to have high standards. It needs to produce um, very professional and ethical leaders. And it needs to be an ongoing development continuum, not uh, just one or two episodic uh, interventions over the course of a career. Thanks, sir. Our next question is the following. How is Australia balancing its preparation for potential large-scale combat operations or high-intensity conflict in the region while not forgetting its lessons in counterinsurgency and stability operations over the last 30 years in current operations around the globe? Um, one of the great things about war is um, no idea ever goes away for long. We might forget about it. Um, so we might spend a few decades preparing for high level conventional operations and forget about uh, counterinsurgency, but it'll come back at some point. Uh, I think uh, we've all been a little guilty perhaps um, at certain parts of our institutional histories of focusing on one um, at the expense of the other. Um, it, it's hard, right? There's, there's only so much bandwidth that leaders have at every single level. You can't do everything and it's, it's about taking a risk-based approach about what the most likely and most dangerous threats are going to be. Uh, for Australia, um, we've just had a, a significant update in our defence strategy. Uh, it was actually launched at the Defence College by our Prime Minister. And uh, he gave a speech I never expected an Australian Prime Minister to give in my lifetime about how dangerous the environment has become, particularly in our region, um, how... Uh, how we would, how we see ourselves as a country, our values, and the, how we're going to protect them, and how we're going to invest in it, um, and that's come with a significant upswing in money and investment in all our military services. Um, so we've been the beneficiaries, I guess, of this environment. Um, but you know, in, in there, it balances high-end um, deterrence. Uh, with getting out and working with our partners in the Pacific, which isn't even, which is just engagement, right? And uh, it's just, it's that balancing act. It's a risk-based balancing act. Um, what's the most likely thing that you're going to be up to in the next couple of decades? And then you invest in that and then you risk manage other things. Sir, as we say in, a, in American baseball, this one's coming slow across the plate. Sir, what are you reading now and why? Oh, wow. Uh, well, I, I normally have three books going at any one time. I normally have one non-fiction, uh, uh, one, uh, one fiction and, and a couple of non-fiction. Uh, I guess I'll start with a fiction. Um, I'm rereading the John Schools, The Old Man's War series. Uh, one, because I think across a series of four books, he, he nicely goes from the tactical to the green strategic level, but there's lots of lessons for everyone from a squad leader through to a general in that series. And uh, I'm collaborating with um, uh, just a recently retired US Army officer in a book around how you might use science fiction um, to think about future war. Um, a couple of the uh, uh, nonfiction books I've, I've recently finished. Tom Ridd's book on uh, Russian disinformation is one of the best books I've read this year. Just a, just a tremendous, tremendous book. And Williamson Murray's recently published book on uh, the culture of military organisations uh, is one of the very few books that's looked at um, in, in some depth uh, military cultures, how they evolve, uh, how they're positive, how they can be negative and how they can get in the way of 
uh, developing military leaders and effective military institutions. Sir, thank you very much for your presentation. Any final remarks? Um, I'd just like to firstly um, thank Pat for the opportunity to participate in this virtual warfighter conference. I mean, it's, it's such a great initiative. Uh, it's so important that uh, military leaders, our, our NCOs, our officers, our sergeants major are able to get together and, and talk about not easy issues, it's the tough issues that we need to, need to talk about. And these kind of conferences, whether they're virtual, live, or even just a unit PME session, um, are a critical part of developing um, that those team and individual skills we all need now and into the future to lead our people well. So um, thank you to Pat and to all the organisers. It's a great pleasure to participate this. Um, and I'm really hoping at some point in the next year or so, we can all get out and the international borders open and we can do some of these discussions uh, live and in person. Um, but uh, it's been a great pleasure to be part of your conference and uh, thank you to the team there. Sir, thanks again. And for the team, uh, go ahead and back out of this session and then click on the uh, general uh, airs uh, presentation, which will occur here in the next couple minutes.